Cinema cameras are expensive, and it is especially difficult to find one that would be worth the money while being affordable enough for most people to start off. Blackmagic Design has tried to bring cinematic quality to low prices with this exact model of the Blackmagic Pocket Cinema Camera that initially, when it was first released, started off at $1,000. It's cheap for a cinema camera and expensive for someone that's never really owned a camera of that caliber, such as entry-level filmmakers, for example. Well, with this release of the 4K model costing around $1,300 to $1,400, the 1080p model, the one I'm reviewing today, has dropped significantly in price today. And you should be able to find this guy at around $500, even $400, usually around that price tag. With that said, today, this camera is worth it more than it ever has been, and here's why. Introducing the Blackmagic Pocket Cinema Camera. Let's talk about it. The exterior design of this camera consists of a very lightweight body that is significantly smaller than something like the normal Pixel 2. And the Pixel 2 is already a small device, so imagine this guy is actually significantly smaller. I'd say that it's maybe the size of the iPhone 5, actually, if anything, which is crazy small. And it has this very soft and comfortable rubberized material around the grip and the frontal portion of the body that makes this camera so nice and comfortable to hold for long periods of time. Everything else, though, is just plastic, though it is okay in terms of durability. It doesn't take too much to scratch it up by accident, but that's just the nature of budget cameras, I suppose. It is a durable camera and very premium feeling for the grips in particular, but the trimming isn't really all that great. Overall, it's still pretty good. On the top of this camera, you're going to find a quarter inch mount. You're also going to find a rewind button, play pause button, forward button, and a record button. And then over here on the back, you're going to find an iris button, a focus button to trigger the autofocus. There's also going to be a directional pad to be able to navigate through the menus and an OK button to select any of your options. Also, you're going to find a menu button to access the menu in the first place. And then you're going to see the power button. For this specific camera, there's going to be an accessory port. That's what I'm going to call it. There's a headphone connector. There's also a microphone connector. There's a micro HDMI port and there is power in. So you can use external batteries with it as well. And then at the very bottom, you're going to find another quarter inch connector. This is mostly probably for use with your tripod. And then there is a little slot. You can just unlock like this and you're going to find a mini USB connector. You're also going to find the ba battery slot and an SD card slot. This camera features a very underwhelming 800 by 400 resolution display that does not look very good at all. It is a matte display, which makes it better for use of doors. And it is good enough for making sure that everything is in focus. However, I would definitely invest in a separate monitor for making sure that everything is as it's supposed to be. This was definitely part of the reason why this camera was so cheap back then. In terms of colors, this display is noticeably inaccurate. You might see the colors in one way on this display and then move it over to a computer and realize that on that computer screen, the colors look completely off than what you were expecting. Again, I really highly recommend a secondary display. And this camera features a micro four thirds mount for your lenses. Though you can adapt full frame lenses to it using an adapter such as a speed booster. In fact, that's what I used to do, but I actually kind of prefer the look of Micro Four Thirds, so I switched back. Pretty much anything that is Micro Four Thirds should be able to fit this camera just fine, and it also supports autofocus, so you're not just limited to using manual lenses. You can go for something fancier if that's what you wanted. And speaking of that same flexibility that I just mentioned, there is definitely a ton of flexibility in regards to the settings of this camera. So for example, the menus here are very cleanly laid out, so you will not have to dig around for things for very long. And they're actually very easy to find. So the settings are something that you can definitely get accustomed to finding right away. Let's talk in greater detail about that. You can change the ISO from 200 to 1600, the shutter angle from 11.25 to 360 degrees, the white balance from 2500K to 8000K. You can also play around with the different audio channels for your microphone and get very specific about your audio levels while switching between audio devices on the fly. You can shoot in different formats as well, like ProRes HQ, 422, LT, Proxy, and just straight up raw. You can change the dynamic range between film and video settings or formats. You can also set the frame rate from 23.97 all the way to full 30 frames per second. 
with 24 frames per second and 25 frames per second as well as 29.97 frames per second also being options if you would like to follow those standards instead. I always shoot at a full 24 frames per second, for example. So yeah, definitely in regards to frame rate, there's also a ton of flexibility, even though you don't have the option for 60 frames per second. So slow motion footage is probably not going to be an option for you here. And so there are also some very minor display settings as well, but you already get the idea by now. This camera gives you a lot of room to try a lot of different things which is what makes it so awesome. And now, on to the video quality of this camera and some test shots. So, this is a video-only camera. This cannot take any photos. So we're only going to be focusing on the video aspect. Now, I always like to shoot at the 24 frames per second 1080p format, with this camera in particular. I really like the cinematic look in general, but since this camera is specifically made for that sort of thing, it is tuned for just that. The image is a little softer around the edges and never over sharpens anything. As you can see, shooting with this type of camera usually gives you very muted tones for the colors, but this is all on purpose so that you can color grade it to your heart's content. This is all for the sake of flexibility. For the user, even though everything here was shot in ProRes HQ, you've still got a lot of room for color correction. Keep in mind that if you wanted even more flexibility, you still have the option to shoot and raw, giving you even more flexibility in terms of how you can color correct it and what customizations you can get with it in post. So yeah, as I keep saying, there's a ton of shooting flexibility with this camera. Now let's go ahead and talk about the workflow in regards to color grading. And speaking of which, this being a cinema camera, you do have to adjust a workflow to work with it versus other video cameras that don't require too much work on your end. In Adobe Premiere Pro, I like to use the fast color corrector since it gives me mostly everything that I need. This is okay starting out, but I would definitely encourage you to get a grip on Lumetri Color, which is a much more powerful color correction tool within Adobe Premiere Pro. Now with that said, I would like to give you a demonstration of what my workflow looks like, color grading and stabilizing shots using this camera, just to make things look a little nicer and in case you need the help. Okay, so right now I'm going to walk you guys through my workflow. So let's say that I just wanted to color grade. Okay, so here I just have some very simple footage, some plants here, these are actually tomato trees. So let's start by color grading this piece here. So like I mentioned earlier, I like to use the fast color corrector. I just feel like it is the fastest way of doing it, but there are better ways of, of correcting these. So the first thing I'm going to do is create an adjustment layer so that all of the changes are being made on this layer and so that I don't affect the footage itself. So let's just try to work around this piece here. So now if you click and drag the fast color corrector on it, and then you can look at the effects controls panel, you will, you'll see that there's a lot you can do here. You can mess around with the hue, just which color takes the most precedence here. But for now, let me just see if increasing the saturation might help just a little bit. And it does here. So now it definitely looks more vibrant. However, I might want it to look maybe just a little bit brighter. So I'm going to increase the input level for white over here and just increase the saturation a little bit. And that should look okay. It definitely looks livelier than it did before. Now, if I wanted to create a little bit more contrast, even though it's not necessary per se, I can just come all the way to effects and then look for contrast. And then the option you want to go with is brightness and contrast. So just drag that over the adjustment layer one more time. And then you can say increase the contrast by five and it just got a little bit more contrasty. Now the colors will be sticking out a little bit more. I actually do like this footage for cinematic purposes. Now let's actually use this clip where I'm caressing the tomato plants. So I'm just going to take an adjustment layer since I made one before and just drag it over just so I can make changes to this. Now this footage is in ProRes, so this isn't really as flexible to work with as raw, but it still gives us a ton of flexibility. Uh, let's just take the brightness and contrast now, just in case we want to look for the fast color corrector one more time. Before I adjust the contrast, I would like to change the colors around. Just the saturation a little bit, see how that looks. Things are starting to look a little bit more yellow, so I'm going to increase the input level of the white just a little bit. Maybe not so much because I do look a bit overexposed there. 
So maybe I would actually like to drop brightness down just a little bit, so maybe minus five. And as for the contrast, maybe increase that by five. And sure, it does look a little bit better. It looks a little bit more natural, but my skin still looks a little bit overexposed. And that partly has to do because of the way that it was shot and the lighting conditions at that moment. Maybe what I might want is to give myself a little bit uh, to cool off the image a little bit since it is a little bit too saturated perhaps, but I still want to retain that, uh, that vibrance. So I'm just going to push this hue knob just a little bit more towards the blue and that should help quite a bit there. Now the shot does look more natural. Then maybe if we increase the saturation just a little bit more, I am liking the look of this a lot more for sure. My skin looks more natural, even if it's still glowing a little bit for me at the very least. So this particular issue would have probably just have to be fixed uh, before shooting through the camera's own settings. This sort of work does allow the footage to be a lot more workable and the footage went from being bland and almost colorless to now having a lot more vibrance and looking more natural, if you ask me. So that is my workflow when it comes to the ProRes footage. This is just a demo. However, this is what I would keep in mind. And I do hope that this helps make things a little bit more easier. Or maybe if you were afraid of getting into uh, this kind of workflow, just because uh, you were afraid that it might be a little bit difficult, the solution works just fine for me. You can use the fast color corrector for now and then later on move over to Lumetri Color, which will give you a lot more options in terms of what you can do and even experiment with LUTs. With that out of the way, I'm sure that you know by now that I really like this camera, that I do think that it's awesome. It definitely is, but it has some issues. Like I mentioned earlier, the display is not good and does not get very bright. It's very low resolution and will give you inaccurate results in terms of colors. Please invest in a separate monitor to mount on it later. Also, the battery life is the biggest defender of this camera. There seems to be a bad quality control when it comes to these, as they used to last me about 45 minutes each, then they dropped to 10 minutes, then two minutes, then finally just a few seconds, and this is all on a full charge, which is ridiculous. Now, that's an issue that I have encountered with my specific model. That doesn't mean that if you go out and purchase another one, that you will run into that issue. I was just one of the unlucky bunch that had a bad bash, I suppose. And it was too late to get a return or to get this repaired. So unfortunately, I was stuck with that. However, if you are shopping around, do make sure that you find the version that actually has decent battery life. Otherwise, like me, you might have to, have to tether a battery pack to it every time that you need to use it. Now, this particular tethering system, built up from buying parts on Amazon, so I bought different batteries that would fit this connector and then I mounted it using a quarter inch mount that would go on both ends. So with that said, this is the way that I have been able to shoot. Each battery lasts about one hour, so I bought a couple of those and that's how I was able to use this camera in the past. And lastly, there's no hot shoe mount on this guy, which means that you are limited to having to use quarter inch mounts. Now, that's not really a big deal because you can buy adapters for it. However, it is worth noting that you do have to invest on something else unless you only invest in accessories that just utilize a quarter inch mount. In that case, it doesn't matter, but I did figure that it was worth mentioning at the very least. That's all I've got in terms of complaints. I brought those issues up because I do believe that it is important to mention those things as some of those issues might actually be deal breakers for some people. So I believe that it was worth bringing it up. However, if you're still here and need a cinema camera for cheap, then this is the one to get. You can get stellar videos with tons of flexibility packed within such a small body. Now, I wasn't able to take full advantage of this because quite frankly, I'm just not skilled enough. To those that are much more skilled than me, you can get much more beautiful results than what I was able to accomplish. I would consider investing in some battery packs for it as well, just in case as I've always had bad luck with the batteries on this device. And well, this camera has definitely aged very well. You still get fantastic video quality, even so in 2019. I couldn't recommend this enough to you starting filmmakers out there to so give this guy a try. And if you are interested in getting this camera or just wanting to go straight for the 4K model, then we will be leaving some affiliate links for Amazon in the description. If you decide to use any of our links to purchase these, then in that case, we do end up getting a small commission that helps us run things a little more smoothly around here and we'd very much appreciate it. So please go ahead and check those out. And well, thank you for joining me in this review. This has been Francisco from Tech Summit, 
Thank you for watching and I'll be seeing you all later. Enjoy.